Well, thank you, and uh, it is a blessing to be here today. Praise the Lord. It's good to see each one of you and to be able to worship the Lord together. I especially have really enjoyed everything so far, and I especially enjoyed singing Heavenly Sunlight. When I was a boy, there was a radio program, came on every Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock. And after we'd been to church, we came home and we listened on the radio. When this program came, and it was from California, it was uh, the Old Fashioned Revival Hour by Charles E. Fuller. And that was their theme song, Heavenly Sunlight. They sang it every Sunday uh, when they had their program. And so I grew up listening to that song every Sunday. And then sometimes we would sing it in church as well. So that brought back a lot of good memories to be able to sing that song today. And truly, it's a great song, as well as being able to worship in all that we have sung thus far and being with you uh, today. Well, one of the phrases that we use at time in conversation is we say to each other, God bless you. God bless you. Now, sometimes we say that phrase in response to someone sneezing. When they sneeze, at least we do it in where I live, uh, they, we will, they will say, God bless you. Now, there's been a question as to why that's done and where that came from. And we, we know that it came from the 1500s in the time of the bubonic plague that was, uh, that was in Europe. And many people were coming sick and many were dying from that awful disease. And... Uh, one of the symptoms of that plague was to sneeze, was sneezing. And so the, uh, one of the religious leaders, I think it was the Pope Gregory at that time, um, coined this phrase in response to when someone was sneezing because they may have the plague. And so he said, began to see this, God bless you as a kind of a prayer on behalf of those people that were sneezing a prayer that uh, they would uh, not die from the plague, and they'd be healed from the disease. And uh, then uh, now today, that's not why we say it, but we say it just as a way of, of blessing. And sometimes, again, even in just in conversation as believers, it has nothing to do with sneezing, but as we uh, share together and as we are together, we may say to a person as we they leave and as they as we talk to them, and then maybe we, they're, they're, they're leaving. Hello, well, that's good. It looks very interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very interesting, yeah. It's, uh, it's very nice, thank you. And, uh, but we, uh, we'll just say, God bless you. I may say that to you today. You may say that to each other. And it's a means of just a a greeting that we say or a word that we say to describe and that we desire the blessing of God upon the lives of our brothers and sisters. Well, the word blessing means favor. It comes from the Greek word to eulogize. And when you give a eulogy, especially often at a funeral service, memorial service, you give a blessing upon the person who has passed on and you say good things about them. It has to do with favor and we certainly desire God's favor upon us, that God would bless us and that his favor would be experienced in our lives. But how do we experience God's favor? Well, certainly we experience it through salvation, by grace through faith in Christ alone, We experience it as we uh, believe in him, as we trust in him, and as we commit our ways to him. But one of the ways that we, in a special way, experience the favor of God, we're going to see today in the scripture that we're going to use for for the message. It's a scripture that was read earlier in this service. It's found in the book of Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verse 3. 
And uh, it, uh, it begins by saying, blessed. And we know that the word uh, blessed, again, means uh, favor, God's favor upon you. Think of the Beatitudes in Matthew. Each of them began with the word blessed. Blessed are those, blessed are those. And uh, in the book of Revelation, there are several times the word blessing is used, or blessed. And again, it always speaks of favor. They're like Beatitudes. And it's an interesting study to look through the book of Revelation and see all the times the word blessed is used in the context of this book. Blessed are those who are part of the first resurrection and so on. There are several throughout the book of Revelation. Today we're looking at this one. Blessed are the one, those who read aloud the words of this prophecy, the book of Revelation, and it applies to all the scripture. And uh, blessed are those who hear it, and blessed are those who keep what is written, for the time is near. God's people are blessed by the keeping of his word. That's the focus of this verse, and that's what we're going to give our attention to today. God's people are blessed by keeping God's word. And so if you want to be blessed by God, you want to experience God's favor upon your life. And our favor upon us as a church, we are blessed, we are favored, if we keep his word. And so we see, first of all then, as we experience his favor, first of all, the blessing of reading. Blessed are those who read aloud the words of this prophecy. The words of, that are to follow the words of the scripture. <clears throat> and uh, again, we can apply it to all the scripture. Here he's talking about the book of the Revelation. <clears throat> now, when he speaks about those, blessed are those who read aloud the scripture, he's talking about, in that day, those who went from church to church and read aloud the scriptures to the people who had gathered, the believers who had gathered. They called them lectors. You see, back in this time, they did not have Bibles written the word of God as we do today. They did not have, that had not been done yet in terms of the, the New Testament. And so they didn't have that. And uh, we know that when Paul wrote his letters and the other writers wrote their letters, copies were made and lectors, lay readers, readers would go from church to church in all the cities, in all the places where there was an assembly of God's people. And when they gathered for worship, the lector would get up, the reader would get up, and he would read what had been written. So, for instance, when Paul wrote uh, his letters, they would take them, they would go from church to church, and someone would read them. You have James, you have John, you have Peter, and now this would be the same here, what John has written in terms of the Revelation. So, imagine, you come to worship on Sunday morning, and someone comes and reads aloud the scripture that had been written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit coming from these various letters or epistles that uh, had been written. And that's how they heard the word of God. And he says it's a great blessing for those who read aloud the word of God. Now we have Bibles today and we can read it on our own, but I think there's still a blessing from you read aloud the scripture. This young man who read the scripture this morning, he did a great job. And there's a blessing when you have that the person who reads it aloud and we can hear it. Uh, we can certainly read it ourselves. But uh, again, there's something that, uh, that is, comes with hearing God's word in uh, our services. I love to hear the scripture read. I think it's a real blessing. And I like to read the scripture. 
And I've done it many times over the years as a pastor. And again, as we pause for the reading of the scripture, there's a blessing for those who read it and uh, who, are, who read it to the people aloud in our service. And so the one who reads the scripture aloud is blessed by God. But then secondly, there's a blessing of hearing. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and, uh, and give attention to it. This refers to the assembled audience in the church. The believers gather to listen to the word of God, to hear the word of God. We're doing that this morning. And uh, in this day, they did as well as uh, one came to read it. The believers gathered to, to hear the scripture. And you know, one of the challenges we face is to listen. Generally speaking, we are not very good listeners. I know I'm not always a very good listener. Someone's talking to me and my mind is elsewhere. Sometimes it happens in our marriages, those of us who are married. I've been married 48 years, just celebrated our 48th wedding anniversary. And my wife, Susan, she couldn't be here today. Hopefully she'll come some other time when I come. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> sometimes she is speaking to me and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden she says to me, you're not listening to me. You're not hearing what I said. And you know what? She's right. My mind is elsewhere. I may act like, I may go, yeah, yeah, I may act like it, but she can kind of tell that my mind is some other place and I'm not really listening to her. And that's true. And Because and, uh, it's hard to listen. If you want to do an exercise today, especially those of you who are married, you go home and you set up two chairs and you two chairs and you face each other. All right? And then the one person says about 15 words. Just whatever whatever you want to say. And then the other person has to repeat word for word what that person said. That's hard. Try it. It's not easy to repeat back word for word. Because, again, it is not easy. Listening is challenging. And so that's why he says here, we are blessed. Blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy, who listen, who pay attention, who commit to, or to, to pay attention to, to hear God's word. And so as we gather even today, we've heard the word read, we now we heard the word, we, we want to, we listen to the word read, we listen to the word proclaimed, and so we're blessed if we hear it, which means that we're really paying attention to it. So blessed are those who read, blessed are those who hear. And then the third, and this is the point we'll, we'll land on for the longest this morning, blessed are those who keep the word of God. The keeping of the word of God it means that we live it out, obey it. What does the scripture say in the book of James? As the scripture says, let us uh, to not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Let's not just hear it, but we're also do it, put it into practice, and do what God has said. And so blessed are those who take God's word to heart. It means and to obey it. So when it says keeping God's word, it means take it to heart. Internalize it. Commit to it. And then live it out. And there are two parts to keeping God's word. One, word, one part is authority. If we're going to keep God's word, we need to believe it is true. We need to believe it has divine authority that God has the power and has the right to establish laws, to govern the universe, to make decisions, to be in control, that God is the highest authority and that he is in charge and what he says stands, for it is the truth. 
It is the truth. It's the eternal truth. It's always been true. It will always be true. Authority. God has the authority because of who he is, the sovereign God, that uh, to, to give his word, to make decisions, to rule the universe, and to speak to us as well. But this is a challenge. Because someone recently... Uh, <clears throat> who does a lot of work, was a man named Josh McDowell. He goes around and speaks. He does a lot of work on apologetics. He goes to college campuses. He talks to students. Often many of are skeptics when it comes to Christianity. And what he's finding is that the, the, uh, the one, the major issue, the number one issue that he faces when he's speaking about Christianity to people, especially to in the college campus world, young people, is that their number one pushback to what he shares is that the Bible is not authoritative. Authoritative. That's what they struggle with. That's what they have the most the most difficulty with in terms of believing that the Bible is authoritative that it's God's word. That's what people struggle with in our world. More than anything else, when it comes to Christianity and it comes to the Bible, they say they have a hard time accepting God is the authority and that his word, the Bible, has authority because God has spoken. That's what they're challenged with. But I don't think it's just the younger generation. I think in general, uh, our population in uh, general uh, has a very difficult time accepting the Bible as authoritative because it comes from God and uh, because it's what we say. We believe the Bible ha is the authority in matters of faith and practice. But again, many do not believe it. What is the problem? What's the problem then with accepting God's word as authoritative. Well, one problem is, is that uh, there are those in our world, in our country, who are sometimes leaders and pastors. And one problem is that uh, this is a reaction to the position of a, the abuse of spiritual authority. It happens sometimes, and we call it authoritarianism. Authority and authoritarianism are two different things. And authoritarianism is when there's control with no concern for the needs of others. There's a dictatorship, no regard for the needs of others, total dominance, total control, no grace, no mercy, no love, no freedom whatsoever, no care for the well-being of others. They just simply, there are those in leadership even called themselves pastors, who have people that they're under their authority and they control it, it's authoritarianism, and the result is then spiritual abuse, where people are abused spiritually. And that happens in our culture, it happens in our country. In fact, someone's just written a book called The Bully Pulpit. Uh, they're having to do with, again, speaking of that issue in the life of the church. Now, it does, I'm not saying it happens here. It doesn't happen in many churches, but in some churches it does. And so there's a reaction against the authority of the Bible because of some leaders in the church who are authoritarianism. And uh, people react against. Authoritarianism is not of God. Authority is, but not authoritarianism. The second issue with the the, with authority and the authority of the Bible and, and authority in general, is understanding the need for authority. We see the word authority as negative, as kind of keeping us from being able to do what we want to do and having a good time. Someone's out to get us. Uh, someone's uh, here to take away our fun. They're, we think of authority as being stern and harsh, out to spoil our lives. That's sometimes what children say to their parents. What do children say to their parents when the parents have laws and rules? 
in the home. You know, an authority. They exercise their God-given authority. The children say, you don't want me to have any fun. You don't want me to have a good time. And, uh, and so sometimes we react against that. Yet, what would our world be like without authority? Think of it. When you leave today and you drive home, you are under the authority of the laws of driving. Suppose when you came to a stop sign, you out here and you see a stop sign, that's authority. Suppose there were no stop signs. How would it be to drive? Traffic lights. You have traffic lights around here? Yes, I, I came through some of them this morning. Red means stop. Green means go. Yellow means do whatever you want. I don't know, but anyway, it has to do with authority. That's authority. And if we didn't have authority when it came to driving and some uh, and lights and stop lights and traffic lights and so on, it would be chaos. I have been in parts of the world where there was no authority on the highway. And believe me, it was not safe. I felt very unsafe. Everyone just kind of went their own way and did their own thing. And uh, it was dangerous. We, we need authority. We need some guidelines. Believe me, sometimes, you know, something happens and the traffic signals don't work. <laughs> you ever been in that situation where you come to a traffic light and it's just blinking red or yellow? It's not working. Nobody knows what to do. And it's, uh, it can be very, very challenging. And so I don't believe we want to live in a world with no authority. What about our parents relating to our children? If we let, what if we let our children just do whatever they wanted? And there was no guidelines, no direction. It would be chaos in the home. And so, so we need authority for our good, but sometimes we fail to understand that. The third problem with authority that people have is that no one tells me what to do kind of attitude. It's our own heart. It's our own spirit. It, uh, years ago, a, a man by the name of Frank Sinatra, who is a famous singer in the United States and throughout the world, sang a song, I did it my way. That was one of his major songs, I did it my way. And that's often our attitude. I want to do it my way. I want to go my direction. You know, God tells us what to do, but I don't really want to follow him. And so because of my issue with authority, I want to go and do the things that I want to do. So times in the church, we have that attitude. No one tells me what to do. You know, and, and no authority will tell me what to do. You know, there's authority in the church. A pastor and those are leaders have authority. And they use God's word and they speak it and they preach God's word and they teach God's word. No one tells me and we rebel against it because no one tells me what to do. I want to do what I want to do. And that's really the heart of our sin nature. That we want to do it our way. We, want to, we don't want to go God's way. We don't want anyone else telling us what to do. And especially when it comes to our spiritual lives. And so, blessed are those who keep his word. And, and here's the of revelation. It's interesting, you know, that you know, we need to submit to that because, again, no one tells me what to do, which really, again, goes against what God has said. But think of the book of Revelation and all that goes on after this. All the... All the uh, celebrations of heaven but all the warnings of judgment and all of that you know he's saying blessed are those who keep the words of this prophecy and that includes opening our hearts to all that revelation has to say regarding again god and the, the, the word to the churches and then he talks about heaven the glory of heaven and then he talks about judgment upon the unbelieving world it's all there and if we're going to say, 
well, I want to do it my way, we're going to lose out because God has played it, made it out very clear. And sometimes people don't like to read Revelation because it gets too, too frightening with all the judgments and what's going to happen. But remember, God's in control of all of this. He is the ultimate authority, and he's carrying out his plan and his direction is given to us here, and we are blessed. We experience his favor if we keep and take to heart the word of this prophecy. And so we need to read all the scripture, and especially some people avoid reading Revelations. Some pastors don't even like to preach in Revelation. Again, because they find it too frightening or too hard or too difficult. But here it's, blessed are those who keep the words of this prophecy, for the time his coming is near. The fourth problem we have with authority is, and it kind of goes with a third in some ways, I am my own authority I decide what is right and wrong. I do it my way. I, uh, what I believe, I believe uh, spiritually is truth. And so you believe your way, I believe my way, and we'll all get to heaven. And we'll all be fine. That is the spirit of our age today. You can believe whatever you want to believe. I will, I will commit to what I want to commit. And I won't push my, I want to, I won't, Push that on your own to push that on you, and you don't need to push it. No one has really authority. We are our own authority to decide what is right and wrong, our own authority to decide what is true spiritually. Uh, Jesus Christ is not the only way. There are many ways to God, and on and on and on and on. And everything has to do with what the Bible has to say. It's up for grabs, and uh, so you can decide what you want to decide. I'll decide what I want to decide, and we will. And keep our own, go our own directions. I am the ultimate authority. I am the one who decides for myself. And this attitude is very, very, very prevalent in our culture. Very prevalent. I decide. And so I set myself up as a mini God. And I am my own authority. And there is, there is uh, something that's very, very seductive about that and something that is very enticing. Because in our own hearts, because of our own sin nature, we want to go our own way. Uh, and, and that is the heart of unbelief. We do, we have that nature, and so there is a challenge to be able to, again, place ourselves under authority and allow God to be the authority. I mean, when you talk, think about that we can be our own authority. Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are? Are we God? I mean, did we create the universe? Do we keep it going? No. It's God, and, so, and he's given us his word, and so we yield to his authority. And so the word is authority, so if we're going to keep it, we keep his word, that means we believe it is true, we submit to the authority of God. He gave it to us for our good, for our blessing. And we find favor with him when we accept and submit ourselves to his will as revealed in his word. Now there's the application of the word of God as well. If we want to be blessed by God, not only do we believe it, but we live it out. We put it into practice. It's not enough to say I believe in God's word. The word of God is true. I want to live it out in my life. And I'm, uh, that means in all matters of faith and practice, we ask ourselves, what does the scripture say? Not what do I say or what do I think? I hear that expression a lot of times in you know, Bible setting, Bible studies, well, I think this, or I think that. No. What does God's word say? It's not about my thinking. It's about what God has to say. What does his word say? And so if I really want to be blessed by keeping it, it's not only I submit to it, but I, then I, I live as though I believe it. And my life is governed by his word. And I just live it out as a, a disciple of Jesus Christ. I don't have to go around carrying a sign. I don't have to go around marching. I just live it out every day and how I live, how I relate. 
You know, God says we're to show love we're to others, we're to, we're to be witnesses, we're to be ambassadors for him. How do we do that? Well, we, recently, someone in our neighborhood, a young couple had a baby. And uh, they don't go to church. They're not involved in anything spiritual. But I know the young lady, the, uh, the mother for the first, I know her. She, I'm a basketball referee, and she used to play, and I ref for her, and I got to know her. So when they had their baby, my wife and I made a meal and took it to them and blessed them with a meal just as a way of letting, of letting to show the love of Christ. You know, to, to, they know, uh, in fact, she calls me Pastor Yoder every time she sees me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and we, we, we share that. You know, we need to let people see, and we don't have to be in your face about it, but just how we live that we really, truly believe God's word. We apply it in our lives. I'll close with this story. Years ago, there was a young couple who had two children, and they weren't believers. They didn't go to church. They weren't interested in Christianity or in church at all. But there came an invitation. Someone came and invited their children to the local Bible school being held by the church. And so they decided, oh, it's good for our children to go to Bible school, so we'll go. We'll send them. We'll send our children to Bible school. That can't hurt them. Have a little bit of religious training. Can't hurt them. So the children went to Bible school. And of course, then at the end of the Bible school, many times, churches have the last closing program where they invite all the parents to come. So the parents got an invitation to come to this closing program. And the husband and wife kind of, they didn't want to go. And so the wife said to the husband, you go. And the husband said to the wife, well, you go. And they went back and forth until finally the husband decided he was going to go. He'd be, he, 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 he was the one that was chosen to go. So he went to the closing program. And at the closing program, there was one of the men of the church. It wasn't the pastor. It was one of the men of the church who kind of led the Bible school, got up and shared the gospel. And he wasn't a very good speaker. In fact, he wasn't good at all. But the man who was there, that young father, was touched. The Spirit of God used what was said to touch him in, by, in this. He said, as I listened to the man, even though he didn't do a good job of speaking, he wasn't a good public speaker, he said, I was taken by the fact it seemed that he really believed what he was saying. He really believed what he was saying. He said, and I, I just couldn't shake that. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And eventually this father and this mother came to know Jesus as their savior because they were in touch by someone who was a believer that when they shared Christ, it came across, they really do believe this. And so as we Commit ourselves to God's word. Blessed are those who <clears throat> read aloud God's word. Blessed are those who hear his word. Blessed are those who keep it, who take it to heart. As we yield to the authority of God and his word in our lives, and we submit to his authority and to his way, we do so then by applying it to our lives, and that our lives are uh, lived in such a way that when people interact with us, they really can tell we really do believe this. We really do. We're totally committed. We're totally in. And in that, be God will use that as a means of drawing people to himself. So let's be sure we're not just hearers of the word, but we're doers. And may we be blessed by, knowing that we were blessed by God. As we read aloud his word, as we hear his word, listen to it, and as we take it to heart, for his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the, your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the authority of your word. Thank you for this church that preaches your word. May we live under your authority and do so joyfully. Because your word 
just a light to our feet, a lamp to our, it gives us direction to our pathway. Lord, we need your direction. Without it, we are lost. We need your authority. Without it, we are, there's just chaos. We see that in our world today. So let us, as your people, uh, recommit to keeping your word, doing so with joy, doing so <clears throat> with commitment, doing so in a way that people will see that we truly believe what we say we believe. Bless this congregation. To this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.